We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So you said we thought we should discuss this issue of suicide at, the, at, the, at this meeting because it, it is something which has almost certainly had a major bearing on the history of our own species. I've shown the, um, a panel from a late Roman ivory casket, which is in the British Museum. Um, you'll see it shows two very different examples uh, of humans who brought death on themselves deliberately. Jesus, who had no desire to stop living, but who believed his death would benefit all mankind. And then Judas, who had no thought of benefiting others, but, uh, but assumed that by his own death would at least put an end to his, to his own intolerable guilt. Suicide used to be called self-murder, um, fellow to say. And it may seem hard to associate, harsh I should say, to associate um, suicide with murder, but if we're looking for the evolutionary antecedents of suicide, I think this does in fact get us off on the right foot. Humans have always been murderers. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, they've been killers of other living beings, I should beings. First, of course, they were killers of animal prey for food, and everybody in the community would have been involved directly in that. But they were also killers of other human beings. Not everyone would have had first-hand experience of assassination, but everyone would have known about it and talked about it um, and no, no doubt celebrated it. And then the idea dawned. Um, here's how psychiatrist Owen Stengel, Stengel has put it. At some stage of evolution, man must have discovered that he can kill not only animals and fellow men, but also himself. It can be assumed that life has never since been the same for him. But I think it wasn't so much the discovery that he, that he can kill himself that would have changed things. It was the discovery of what killing himself would have amounted to, that it would have amounted to removing himself from the world. A human could choose not to be. That's why non-human animals don't and can't commit suicide. Um, at any rate, uh, even if they do kill themselves, as perhaps these whales did, we shouldn't call it suicide, though that BBC headline clearly did suggest we might. The whales can't have been choosing death because, so far as we know, they haven't discovered what death means. But humans, of course, have done. Humans can choose death, knowing pretty well what it will mean for them personally. And I think Stengel's right to say uh, that this discovery has been transformative. But we still have to ask transformative in just what ways? And if we're thinking about human evolution, the question must be, what effects, good or bad, did this discovery have on biological survival? Other kinds of killing can clearly be adaptive. It's easy to explain the survival advantages of hunting. It's not difficult to explain the advantages of war or homicide. But common sense would seem to say that self-killing must be the ultimately disadvantageous act, a sure path to genetic oblivion. 
Yes, uh, the stark fact is that suicide is alarmingly common right across the world. Someone in the United States kills themselves every 12 minutes. That's 120 a day. Across the world, more people die from suicide than all wars and homicides combined. We surely have to ask, then, is suicide biologically adaptive after all? Well, the answer is not going to be simple. As I implied with my first slide, I think we need to distinguish uh, two rather different kinds of suicide. And we can call them, as Durkheim did, altruistic suicide and egoistic suicide. And I want to suggest, to suggest they correspond to two rather different conceptions of what death does. The first and simplest conception is that death results in the annihilation of the body. The dead person is no longer an actor in the physical or social world. And corresponding to this, when people uh, choose to bring about their own death, they may be trying to make things better for others by giving up their own bodily presence. Jesus died on the cross in the hope of becoming the savior of all mankind. Or for a more straightforward example, Captain Oates stumbled out to die in the snow in the hope of relieving the burden for the remaining members of Scott's polar exp ex expedition. Altruistic suicide, we can call that. But could this kind of suicide be adaptive? It certainly could be, provided it benefits the subject's kin or social group. In fact, it's possible that a propensity, propensity for altruistic suicide has been selected in humans in rather the same way that something like it has been selected in the social insects. So maybe humans are genetically predisposed, like ants or bees, to sacrifice themselves for the common good in times of famine or plague or war or simply when they become too old and decrepit to carry on. But now let's look at another kind of suicide, perhaps corresponding to a second conception of what death does. This is that death results in the annihilation of the mind. The dead person is no longer a thinker or a feeler. And corresponding to this conception, when people kill themselves, they may be trying to make things better for themselves by giving up on their own conscious presence. Judas Iscariot sought conscious oblivion because he could, could not live with his internal sense of shame. This young couple could not bear the pain of being forbidden by their families to marry. This is egoistic suicide, um, and it's in many ways the absolute opposite of altruistic suicide. Far from hoping to benefit others, these self-killers are motivated primarily by self-interest. They either don't care about the effect on others, or sometimes they even intend some kind of vengeance. And whether they intend it or not, the effects on family and friends are often devastating. Now, here's the problem from an evolutionary point of view. The fact is that 90% of suicides are egotistical. The World Federation for Mental Health, for example, reports that um, the most common situations of, or life events that might cause suicidal thoughts that have to do with helping other people, their grief, sexual abuse, financial problems, remorse, rejection, relationship breakup, and unemployment. And anthropologist Charles MacDonald, having surveyed suicide across the whole world, concludes, a cross-cultural comparison shows that grief over and conflict between closely related people, together with sheer physical pain and discomfort, cause or promote suicide more often than any other circumstances. The suicide simply wants to stop hurting. What the egoistic suicide wants to achieve is basically self-euthanasia. Well, could this be adaptive? No, how could it possibly be? Most egoistic, egoistical suicides are young. Across the world, it's the most, second most common cause of death amongst teenagers. If they had not died by their own hand, this couple hadn't died by their own hand, they would almost certainly have got over the hurt and gone on to make a success of their lives. Egoistic suicides ruin not only their own biological fitness, but those of related individuals too. So what's going on? Why do these tragic deaths happen so frequently? I think the answer is all too obvious. Humans and humans alone understand that by killing themselves, they can indeed stop the hurting. So there must be circumstances when they may well look on suicide as a rational act. 
they feel sad or jealous or unloved or inadequate or whatever. These are feelings that death will make go away. Nothing hurts less than being dead. In Hamlet's, uh, no, sorry, uh, and what's more, as the poetry of suicide continually reminds us, this solution to the hurting may not only be rational, it must often be relatively easy. In Hamlet's notorious soliloquy, who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, when he himself might his creators make with a bare bodkin, a dagger. As Hamlet recognizes, there's an unfortunate truth about being human, probably more true of humans than any other animal, and it is that hurting is part of life. The poet Cesare Pavese said it explicitly, everyone, every human, has a good reason for suicide. The philosopher Wittgenstein once told a friend that all his life there had hardly been a day in which he hadn't thought suicide a possibility. More typically among today's American high school students, 60% say they've considered killing themselves. 14% have thought about it seriously in the last year, and 5% have attempted it. That's more than one million students a year. Susan Sontag has written, how thin the line between the will to live and the will to die. How about a hole, she asks, a really deep hole which you put in a public place for general use. In Manhattan, say, at the corner of 70th and 5th, a sign beside the hole reads, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, suicide permitted. Just that, a sign. Why, surely people would jump who had hardly, hardly thought of it before. As I said, it's not only rational sometimes, but it's also very easy. Now, this is a Carter Symposium, and we want to understand how humans, against all the odds perhaps, have, in the end, survived and prospered. And it looks as though suicide might have been a very significant drain on the fitness of our ancestors. It looks as though it might have been a major downside of their growing sufficiently clever to understand their own mortality, the very sequence Angie talked about. It wouldn't have been bad because, uh, dangerous because they feared death, but because they were attracted to it. But surely natural selection then ought to have sorted this out long ago. Why haven't humans evolved to have better innate defences against suicide built into their minds? Well, of course, Ajit thinks they have. When reality becomes too much to bear, people simply deny it. But I confess, I don't see this working as he says, or at least not in these contexts. I see no evidence that humans have evolved to have any kind of natural immunity to what I've called the lure of death. To the contrary, I'm led to think that in the past, if not today, suicide might have spread like measles in an unprotected population. In fact, measles is a surprisingly, alarmingly apposite analogy because the suicide meme happens to be highly infectious. It jumps from mind to mind, resulting in the well-documented phenomenon of copycat suicides. As Durkheim wrote, suicide is very contagious. There's the well-known story of the 15 patients who hung themselves in swift succession in 1772 from the same hook in the dark passage of the hospital. Um, suicide contagion has been dubbed the Werther effect after the hero of Goethe's, Goethe's novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. The Sorrows of Young Werther. In the novel, Werther kills himself after falling hopelessly in love with a married woman. Following its, pu its publication in 1774, there were literally hundreds of copycat deaths in Germany. Recent research has confirmed just how strong the effect is. Every time a celebrity suicide is given uh, exposure in a newspaper or TV, the copycats follow. It's estimated that Marilyn Monroe's death in August 1962 was responsible for 200 extra suicides within a month. After a popular South Korean actress hung herself in 2008, suicides jumped 66% that month, with young hanging victims accounting for the most of the increase. But 66%? That's nothing. There are some parts of the world today where rates of suicide are 10 times the average elsewhere, and this turns out to be largely to do with copying. 
among these happy people on the island of Palavan in the Philippines, McDonald's research has documented waves of suicide spreading through small villages. The question becomes then, how prevalent was suicide amongst our ancestors, say, 50,000 years ago? I don't think any paleoanthropologist paleo has ever thought to ask. But assuming humans must by then have acquired an understanding of death, we can be quite sure there were suicides. And let's remember, times were harsh. In the icy climate of Central Europe, there would have been plenty to be unhappy about. I think we should allow the possibility that there were indeed recurrent plagues of egoistic suicide with rates topping anything we see today. Well, if this is true, if it, there were these plagues of suicide, and I think it's a genuine scientific possibility, what could and did bring it under control? Assuming humans have never evolved adequate natural immunity to suicide, the antidote, whatever it was, must have been cultural. And here I have to say the picture is complicated and not well researched. But at least some of the cultural barriers to suicide are indeed in, pl in plain view. In historical times, religious authorities have regularly issued anathemas against it. Medieval Christianity decreed that self-murderers would go to hell. Victims would not be given a decent burial, but rather be buried at the crossroads at night with a stake through the heart. In many countries, attempted suicide has also been made a crime under the common law. In the United Kingdom, attempted suicide was not decriminalized until 1961. In the 10 years pre-1961, there were 6,000 prosecutions, 5,400 attempted suicides were found guilty and imprisoned or fined. It was common practice in the 1950s in Britain to have a policeman sitting at the bedside of an unconscious patient in accident and emergency waiting to interview the patient when he or she revived. There have also been attempts to limit the spread of suicide, the suicide meme, meme by limiting exposure to it. In Europe, after the after the effect of Goethe's book became apparent, it was soon banned in several countries. In Germany, it was even forbidden to dress like young Werther in blue coat and yellow trousers. In most countries today, there are strict press guidelines intended to play down the reporting of suicide, to keep it off the front page and to avoid sensational headlines. So we've had suicidal acts being punished and information about them suppressed. Do these measures actually work? Well, yes, I think there's reason to think they actually probably do, or at any rate, there's no reason to think that they don't. But surely more focused methods ought to work as well. In place of punishment or censorship, why not try to fight meme with meme? Why not oppose a destructive mind virus with a redemptive one? What should we tell people who want to kill themselves? The English priest Chad Vara founded the, the, the Samaritans in 1954, a group dedicated to talking suicides down with words of reassurance. The message, there is hope, may seem to verge on the banal, but in fact it's the one message we can give with confidence. Research shows that in nine cases out of ten, the hurt isn't going to last. Here's Daniel Gilbert, who already uh, actually quoted, uh, author of the book, Stumbling on Her Happiness. Few of us can accurately gauge how we will feel tomorrow or next week. We expect to feel devastated if our spouse leaves us or if we get p passed over for a big promotion at work. Um, but when things like that do happen, it's soon, she never was right for me, or actually, uh, I needed me more free time for my family. People mistakenly expect such blows to be much more devastating than they turn out to be. In a sense, it's a pessimism bias. bias. We think things are going to be really bad, so bad that we can do nothing but end our lives. But the message of this research, I suppose, is don't jump now, because it's not what your future self would choose. But have we had to wait for a Harvard psychologist to tell us this? No, thankfully not. The message is implicit, perhaps for actually presumably for a good reason, in much of the hand-made-down wisdom of our old cultures, in stories and songs and proverbs and so on. And the good news for our species is that, on the whole, 
with too many dreadful exceptions, hope can and does win out. And I think that's what basically has taken us out of the Ice Ages to where we are today. Okay, um, this is the closing talk of the symposium. We've heard a lot today about what a bad thing death is. We haven't actually heard much about what a good thing life is, which is in the end, of course, the whole point. So I'll finish with a passage from George Borrow's autobiographical novel, Le Vengre, which echoes some of the things actually Sheldon was saying. As Borrow tells it, he's been reading Goethe, and it's an autobiography, I think he had been, and he's toying with the idea of suicide. He gets into conversation with a Romany gypsy, Jasper, whom he's befriended on his travels. I read a passage from the novel. What is your opinion of death, said I, as I sat down beside him? Jasper replies, life is sweet, brother. Who would wish to die? I would wish to die, says Borrow. You talk like a fool, says Jasper. Wish to die indeed. There's night and day, brother, both sweet things. Sun, moon and stars, brother, all sweet things. There's the wind on the heath, brother. If I could only feel that, I would gladly live forever. Well, this painting is in fact called The Wind on the Heath. And I think the good news is that we've all been there. Thank you. Thank you.